Are there any questions about the announcement? Because I sent this, this particular announcement yesterday, because as I was prepare, pre preparing for the lab today, I was just thinking, hmm, okay, you know, I probably need to remind people to kind of at least review the content from last week, because that is gonna be very useful for today's lab. Um, I mean, I changed the lab from last year, you know, to add, you know, like a one major question, you know, so that people actually have to track down the control signals of um, the ROM going to all the different components. And that's why, you know, the review of the material from last Thursday will be very useful for today's lab. There's another way to look at this for people who did not review the material and did not quite understand the material. This is gonna be a hard lab. So that's the other way to look at it. But we'll go over the material again today. So we'll get re-familiarize those concepts. Um, so hopefully it's not gonna to be too difficult for most people. Oh, no more minutes. All right, we got twenty to go. All right, it is 5.30. I am going to get started. So I sent out this particular announcement yesterday that you know, I redesigned or I added a new question for today's lab. And as a result, you know, being understanding the material that we talked about from last Thursday is going to be quite useful for this lab. I will go over you know, about the same material today, 
um, but in a slightly different way you know, for today. So hopefully that will also help people who did not have time to review the material from last Thursday. So before I start, are there any questions from the material that we have talked about so far? Okay, I'm not hearing any questions. Okay. And this is why I like you know teaching face to face is I can even though I do not have my you know long distance you know, classes I can still make out you know facial expressions even for people all the way in the back um, you know but if I were to teach you know, this class online or remotely even using you know Zoom most people don't even turn on the webcam I can't really tell whether people are understanding the material or not. All right. Well, without any questions, I am going to switch to Jocelyn. And basically, this is an outline of what we'll be talking about today. I can zoom in. It's not really that important. I'm just going to go over these two instructions. One is load immediate, which is LDI. And then the other one is CPR, which is copy register. So we'll talk about these two instructions. And what I'll do is I'm going to go through the same process as last Thursday, which is single clocking through the processor architecture so that you can actually see how the connections between the components are established using the ROM, which we know as the microcode in the processor. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, and if I go back to here, um, I don't have my um, opto table with me. It's on a different window. So let me pull that over here. There we go. All right. So this is the opto table, uh, which I think you guys you probably should know where to find at least. So the first instruction I want to go through is the CPR instruction, which is an easier instruction. LDI is a little bit more difficult. So the CPR instruction is, I wrote this and I can't find it, right? Right here, row 15. Okay, so when you look at row 15, you know, the description of um, column C is pretty simple. Remember column C is using the C, C++ notation to try to define what that particular opcode is going to be. X is a register, Y is a register, X equals Y is an assignment operation. So that means if whatever Y is identifying as a register, its content, its value is a copy to whatever X is identifying as a register. Yes? Are you recording? Yes, I am recording. As soon as I zoom, you know, I'm recording because I, that's how I configure zoom. So yes, I'm recording, very good. But thank you for checking. All right, so we are copying the value from register Y, which can be A registers A, B, C, or D, to register X, which is also can be a, uh, register A, B, C, or D. Now, it doesn't make sense to copy from register A to register A because it doesn't do a single thing. Okay, so we'll talk about um, hijacking an opcode for something else later on, not in today's class. Okay, because you know, there are certain opcodes that really do not you know, make sense at all. So what we'll do is we'll talk about a specific instruction and we'll demonstrate how that actually works in the processor. Um, so for our purpose, we are going to talk about, let me go back to Joplin again. So I go back here and do some editing. So we'll be more specific about the CPR instruction. We're going to do a CPR CA, okay? So we are copying from register A to register C. The first thing we need to do is to figure out, okay, but what is the opcode for this particular instruction? What you see here is what? what how, do, how do we call CPRCA? It's the mnemonic, very good. Okay, good job. So a mnemonic is for people to easily understand what we want to do, but the actual opcode, which is in binary that the processor understands is something else. So now that we know we want CPRCA, we want to figure out, you know, how do we specify that? So this means your know, register um, C is register X and then register A is register Y. So what is the big pattern for register C? You're staring at it on the screen. So what is the, 
One zero, very good. And then for register A, zero zero. So what is the entire opcode in this case? Zero one zero one is mandatory, and then XX is one zero, and then YY is zero zero. Okay, very good. Zero one zero one is five in hexadecimal, um, and then one zero 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 is eight in hexadecimal. So we have basically five eight as an opcode. All right. So now that we know the opcode, we can switch to Logisim, okay, and then we can go to RAM. I was testing something else, you know, when I was, uh, you know, I was doing something else here. So I'm do, I'm going to type Control R to reset the simulator, and this is a good way to restart the whole thing, you know, just to make sure that you're you're starting up with a clean state. And we can go ahead and zoom in a little bit so we can see. You guys can see a little bit better, and someone else is joining us remotely. Okay, very good. All right, so we're going to change this byte to 58, which is the opcode of CPRCA. And then the next one, I'm going to change it to 01, which is the halt instruction. The halt instruction is not really important in this particular demonstration because the single clock, you know, the single clocking throughout the execution. All right, so we are now ready to run the processor. So do you guys remember, where do we start to try to understand you know, how an instruction execute? Which portion of the processor should we focus on? Hmm? PC, uh, yes and no, because the first thing you need to look at is actually the microcode engine or the controller of the processor. So basically everything, we should start with a microcode pointer because that is actually determining uh, what are we going to do next? Because the microcode pointer is pointing to a location in the ROM, and each location of the ROM is representing a slice of time. And the output of ROM, out, you know, out of the data port, all of these bits, all 26 of these particular bits, will configure pathways between the components in the process. Now, we are at location 000. We are about to have a rising edge. What phase are we talking about here in terms of the uh, cycles or the basis of executing an instruction? There's a name specific to this particular phase. We talked about it last Thursday, but I also wrote a new reading material for you guys. And it specifically, you'll know, talk about you know, what does it mean when we are on location 000 in the ROM and we're having a rising edge? How is, what is this called? Fetch. Fetch, very good. Okay, so this is the fetch cycle of executing instruction. What it does is it uses the program counter and that's why, you know, somebody said, you know, the program counter because it really is useful in this case. The output of the program counter is going through this multiplexer which has a selection, a select uh, setting of one. So they, this means you know, input one is connected to the output, which is then connected to the address port of RAM. And this is why we are addressing location zero, zero in RAM. So the program counter is telling us where to look in RAM. The content of that location is exactly what we you know, kind of plugged in earlier, which is 5.8. So now the question is where, who wants to know what is at location zero, zero? So when we track this down, the only thing that, that's paying attention to 5.8 at this point is the instruction, instru instruction register, because we can see it is enabled. And on the next rising edge of the clock, the, register instru the instruction register will update to 5.8, which is what we are fetching from RAM. So control T, Give it a single clock, and now it is 5.8. The falling edge doesn't do anything with the rest of the processor. The only register that is sensitive to the falling edge is the microcode pointer. In this case, the microcode pointer would only increment to the next location, which is 001 in ROM. So we should see this, these three digits to change to 001, and then location one will be highlighted because you know, that's the next location. All right, so control T, like so, okay? 
So the next edge of the clock is going to be a rising edge again. So with a rising edge, you know, all of the other registers ran, you know, they're all sensitive to a rising edge. So the question is, what are we going to do with this rising edge? Do you guys remember what is the rising edge going to do when we are at location 001 in the micro code pointer? It really doesn't have a name by itself, but it does one thing that is important. Not yet. It increments the program counter, okay? Because the program counter has already done quote, 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 its job, okay? We have already retrieved the opcode from what, what, where it points to. So that means we're incrementing the program counter. So the next fetch will be fetching the next available instruction or the next opcode from RAM. And that's all this cycle is going to do. Um, how we know the program counter is going to be updated is because you can see PCEN is light green, which means it is a one. So the program counter is about to be updated. So obviously the next question is how is it gonna be updated? So we track down the input to the program counter. It is coming out of the multiplexer. This multiplexer has a select of zero, which means input zero is used to connect to the output. And this is coming from an adder the adder is going to simply add one to the current value of the program counter. So the program counter is essentially auto incrementing. Do we have any questions about this little sub circuit of how we auto increment the program counter? Okay, all right. So the control T, the program counter changes to zero one. The next um, edge is a falling edge. So with a falling edge, the micro code pointer is going to be updated. So the question is, how is it going to be updated? And this is where we have to decode, okay? Because even from just looking at the diagram, you can see the micro code pointer is going to be updated because the clock is currently high. So the next transition is going to go low, which means we have a falling edge. The falling edge will update the micro code pointer. The question is, how is it going to be updated? The input to the micro code pointer is coming out of the multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of zero, which means input zero is going to connect to the output. So now the question is, what is input zero? Input zero has the highest eight bits, bit four to 11, coming from the tunnel called instruction, which is the same tunnel as this one, which is the output of the instruction register. In other words, the eight bits that we have retrieved from location zero, zero is going to be bit four to bit 11 of the micro pointer. Okay, so what about bit zero to bit three? From the diagram, can you tell how we specify bit zero to bit three of the micro pointer? Zero. There's just four zeros. Yep, there are four zeros. So that means, you know, what do we expect to be in the micro pointer? In hexadecimal. Hmm? Well, there's a zero in it, but there are two other digits, right? So tell me all three digits. Uh, close. Because the zero is the least significant four bits. 580. Eight zero. Very good. Okay, so it's going to become 580. And this particular transition is called decode. Because what we are doing is we are taking the opcode and then we are translating that into the address of ROM where the 26 bits will be specified to control you know, how things are connected in the process. So once we have control T, this is where it really matters, okay? So the next instruction, when, we, when I explain the LDI instruction, I won't even bother with the fetch and the decode because the execute cycle is what makes each opcode unique. Otherwise, they all have to be fetched, they all have to be decoded. So now we can look at the execute cycle of an instruction. So this particular bit pattern in hexadecimal, it is 15008D0, specifies 26 bits. And the question is, what is it gonna do? So, what we need to do now is to go through all the components that can be updated and ask, are you going to be updated? Are you going to be updated? And so on. So we'll start with the program counter. So does it look like the program counter is going to be updated? 
No, because the program counter enable is dark green, which means it is a zero. We have a few other things that can potentially update. RAM can potentially update as well. So do you think RAM is going to update or provide anything useful in this particular execution? No, and why not? Because, because RAM cell or RAM chip select is dark green, which means the RAM component is not even paying attention. It's not doing anything at all. Okay, so RAM is not being used. The program counter is not updating. What about the ALU? This is the ALU. So do, we, do you think the ALU is involved in this particular execution? No, because the enable is dark green. So the ALU is not even enabled. It doesn't care, it doesn't do a single thing. So that pretty much leaves the only thing that can be doing something useful is the register bank, okay? So we now go to the register bank. You know, this is the register bank. And we can tell that in enable, input enable is a bright green, which means one of the four registers will be updated. We don't quite know which one, but I know one of them is going to be updated. So the next question is, um, how is it getting its input? So to understand that, we have to track down the in port of the register bank, which is this one here. It's coming out of a multiplexer. So we have to look at the selected of the multiplexer, which is a zero. So now we know input zero connects to the wire that is highlighted. So what I'm showing you here is something that I want you guys to be able to do, okay? Is to figure out what is getting updated. How is it getting updated? How do we figure out the routing between the components? Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Because there's no way I'm gonna describe every single one of these you know, 20 something instructions in class. I want you to be able to figure all that out by yourself. So do we have any questions about that portion? How I'm tracking down you know, which input goes to the output for a multiplexer and so on. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. All right, so if input zero is connecting to the output and the multiplexer is enabled, then we have to track down input zero, which is this particular, this particular node. It goes to a lot of different places, right? It goes to the data port of RAM, but I don't really care about that particular, that particular connection because RAM is not being active. So it's not contributing to anything. Okay, uh, what else do we look at? Well, we look at this connection here. It is irrelevant to us because we know we are looking for something that is outputting content. This B port of a register is an input. So it's not going to contribute anything. It's actually just trying to read something and we know the instruction register is not been enabled. So that is not useful to, in our discussion. Uh, we look at this connection here, which is uh, the input, one of the two inputs of a multiplexer. We know it is irrelevant also because we are looking for an output, not an input. So the only output other than the data port of RAM is coming out of this demultiplexer. And this demultiplexer is enabled. How do we know? Because register output zero enable is light green. So this demultiplexer is indeed enabled. Are we still doing okay so far? All right. So if it is enabled, it is possible that this output is not the one being selected. That is possible. So we want to check. So we click on this Y here and it says one zero in binary. So is the output that we, look, we, were, looking at, we were looking at earlier, is that output one zero in binary? Yes, it is, right? So now we know this demultiplexer is outputting something to update a register. But what is the input of this demultiplexer? It connects to out zero of the register bank. So we have done as much as we can outside of the register bank. So now what we can now tell is there is a route, there is a path from output zero of the register bank into the in port of the register bank. Right? Okay. But we don't know which register is going to be updated. We do not know which register is connected to output zero of the register bank. 
So now we can just right click on the register bank, go to view res bank, and it maintains the state, okay, of the outside of the outside circuitry. And but this time we can actually tell exactly how things are connected. In cell, input select is a one zero. So we know this register is the one that is enabled. It is indeed register C. The register C is going to be updated. The question is, who is the output? Who is going to output zero of the register bank? This is output zero. It is coming from a multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of zero, zero, which means input zero connects to the output. So that means register A is providing the data that eventually goes around the entire thing back to the input, which is then used to update register C. And that completes the explanation of CPR C8. Do we have any questions? Now, I can also you know, make this obvious that something is being done because I can change register A to something first other than zero, zero. I can change this to, for instance, AB, and then register C can have an initial content of CD because this way, you know, I can tell, you know, in the next rising edge that we are accomplishing what we set out to do. Right now, the clock is still low, which means when I type control T again, we'll have a rising edge, which means you know, at that point, we can we should see register C updating to the content of um, hexadecimal AB. Are we good so far? All right, so I'm going to type control T on the keyboard, control T, and you can see how register C is now updated to AB and hexadecimal, and we, now we have completed the operation. Are there any questions? So I'm going to pause in the discussion and see if there are any questions at this point. Yes? What was that CPRCA you're talking about? This is what CPRCA is going to do. And the description of CPRCA is, is, it looks like an assignment. It is using whatever register we specify for Y to update whatever register we specify for X. So in this specific case, register X is register C and the register Y is register A. Yep. All right, so it would seem that we are done, but we, I'm gonna continue one more step in the simulator going back to the main circuit because last time we did not have time to figure out, um, so how do we reset the micro code pointer back to location zero, zero, zero? So what we wanna do now is to say, what's gonna happen when we have a control T again, which is going to be a falling edge. So the first thing we observe is the multiplexer, that is feeding into the micro code point. So on the next falling edge, the multiplexer has a one, which means it is coming from the auto increment mechanism. We're simply adding one to whatever micro code pointer has. But I can tell you, if I control T, you guys are gonna say, but that's not what happened. What is gonna happen? Why did it happen like that? So to understand what I just said, we'll go into the ROM content and find out what is actually at location 581. So we'll go to edit content. And of course it has to open this window on the other monitor. All right, so we'll go to location exactly 581. Okay, scroll a little bit until we get to five. This is 580 and this is 581. So for all those of you in the back of the classroom, it needs two and then followed by six zeros. So that means only bit 25 is a one, everything else is a zero. Okay, so now we go back to the main circuit and we try to find out what do you mean by bit 25 is a one? So bit 25 is this particular bit here. It connects to what kind of a gate is, is this? Or it's an OR gate, very good. So with the OR gate, if at least one input is a one, the output is gonna be a one. So that means you know, if I type control T again, this wire will become a one. And where does it go to? It goes to a port that is labeled zero. What does that mean? 
is, is a reset, exactly. So that is how we reset the micro code pointer is by a single bit coming out of the ROM, it connects to the reset port of the micro code pointer. And that's how we can reset everything back to location zero, zero, zero. And that's on the falling edge. So on the next rising edge, we are ready for a fetch construction again, or the fetch cycle again. So just to make sure that we understand how this, that, how this is going to happen, I'm going to type control T on the keyboard and you can see that you could not even see the micro code pointer changing to 581 because the amount of time is so short that you, you don't even see it. It just, it, it is as if, you know, it went straight from 580 all the way back to 000, which means we are now ready to fetch the whole thing. Yes. If you want to make it slower, you can zoom out and just hold the reset button like at the very top. Oh. And then you can kind of see it, it like delays it. So, oh, the, the reset button? button? Um, just like the little button. Right, so, right. So you can just hold that and then it'll hold that state until you release it. So you can okay. kind of see it on. Like, okay. Yep. Did it, did it change the fire that you want on our following? Did it what? It did change to 581 for a very short amount of time that we cannot see unless you use that trick. And then now we're back to our right Now we are, well, what do you what do you think? What is the state of the clock? Is it a zero or a one right now? It's a zero. So if I type control T again, it is going to be transitioning from a zero to a one, right? So transition to a zero to a one is a, it's a rising edge. That's right. Mm -hmm. right. So we change T to A on the rising edge. That happened a while ago. And then went on a falling edge and uh, 580 became 581. Yes. The micro cool pointer also incremented from 580 to 581, mm -hmm. but the micro code content at location 581 forces the micro code pointer itself to reset itself back to 000. So the following is 581 and then 000. Well, it's not so much the falling edge that makes it 000, it is the content at location 581 causing the reset port to be a one and that in return we set the micro code pointer to zero zero zero. Which is another falling edge. No, it belongs to the same edge. You know, the falling edge itself only cost the micro code pointer to increment to 581. That's what it did. The falling edge is responsible for the micro code pointer changing to 581. But once the micro code pointer is at 581, the content at that location, the two followed by six zeros, is turning on the you know, bit 25 of the output, which then connects to the reset port of the register. And that is why the micro code pointer changed, changed to 000, and that makes us ready for the next fetch cycle again. Okay. So there are a few things happening, but the falling edge is only responsible of changing the micro code pointer to 581. It is the content at location 581 that is responsible to reset the micro code pointer itself. What's the property? Hmm? So what's the, right now, we're just not doing anything? We are now at the clock, the clock is zero right now. So the next control key is gonna be a rising edge which is the beginning of another fetch cycle in terms of executing an instruction. Yep. So does every time it hits, every time the microphone pointer is at zero, it's, the, it's a fetch cycle. That is correct. Okay. Yep. All right, so this may be a good time to kind of go back to the note that I wrote um, last week. And I sent that link last week as well, but it's important to know where to find the reading material you know, related to what we are talking about. So that belonged to TTP explained sort of, 
And the sort of is intentional because I need you guys to be actually following the procedure, the process. So the phases of executing an opcode. Okay, let me zoom in. All right, so this is the fetch cycle. When the micro pointer is zero on the rising edge, the instruction register is going to get the content pointed to by the program counter. So that's you know, where we get the fetch cycle description. So if you have not read this module, you know what to do, right? Because you know that's the, I wrote this module for a reason. And what do you think that reason would be? You guys to read it, exactly. Because in all the previous semesters, I just talk about it in class and people do not seem to, you know, remember. So this time I wrote, you know, I made a new module and I explained the fetch, decode, and execute cycle by relating all of those terms to the micro pointer, which edge we are on, and what's happening you know, during that new transition. So it's important to read the reading content here and also make that connection to the demonstration in class. But that's okay, because I'm assuming that you guys here will be reading the notes and understanding this material. Today's lab is kind of designed around that assumption. So just by paying attention right now, you're helping yourself. It's all good. Any other questions? So that's a good question. It's, it's a good uh, clarification question. Any, any Anything else from what I just did with CPR? Yep. Was the PC uh, program counter updated after you reset the... That's the ambiguous part. Because you know, the, the program counter does increment on the rising edge when the micro pointer is zero zero one. That's when it also increments, but it technically is not a part of the fetch cycle nor the decode cycle. It's kind of something that we need to do, but we don't really have we don't we don't know which you know phase it belongs to. There's no technical definition of whether the fetch cycle should include the auto increment of the program counter. But it needs to be done, and it is done when the micro code pointer is zero zero one, and we have a rising edge. That's a good question. Anything else? Anything else before we transition to talk about the LDI instruction? Going once, going twice. Yep, I don't have a little hammer thing. Um, all right, so we'll move on to the next instruction, which is the LDI instruction. So with any type of instruction, the first thing you need to do is to go to the opcode table and see how it is described. So we do a L, uh, control D, control F, sorry, you know, to look up LDI. So that's a really quick and easy way to look up something in the spreadsheet is just use control F for search. So this is the description of LDI, which stands for low immediate. Low immediate, okay? Whenever you see the word immediate, it means constant. That's it, okay? So immediate means constant. It means something that is determined at assembled time. It is not something that you would change at runtime. It is all determined at assembled time. What do you mean by assembled time? Assembled time is really the same thing as compile time. It is when the tool is looking at the source code to figure out what opcode will become your program. So LDI is loading you. So this part is easy, but column C is confusing because column C is trying to explain this operation in two different ways. So we'll take a look at you know, what do you mean by two different ways? The first way of explaining it is actually the best way to explain it. This is actually what is happening inside the process. In other words, register, whatever register X is specifying is getting the content in RAM that is currently pointing pointed to by the program counter. After this, the program counter auto indicates. Is that okay? So I'm really hoping everybody is familiar with the operator, the asterisk operator, which is known as the reference, because you know, in, in order to explain instructions, 
A lot of times we have to refer to the referencing because we are using a register to connect to the address port of RAM and therefore controlling which location of RAM we are reading or writing to. Okay, so this is what it's actually doing. However, from the more superficial perspective, it is more like it is doing this. X equals to I. In other words, whatever I we specify here, which has to be an integer, is going to be loaded into whatever register X is specifying. So from that perspective, it is easier to understand because all you're trying to say is, oh, so all you're really saying is we initialize a register, whatever X is representing, using a constant. So in effect, yes, that is what it is doing. But the mechanism to get it done is explained by the other expression, which is this part over here. So this explains the mechanism. This part here explains effectively what does it end up doing. All right, well, my watch just buzzed, which reminds me to take roll. So we're gonna take roll today now. Let me uh, go back to the modules. So whip out your mobile device if you're not on one already. And then we look for today's date, which is um, the 28th. Here we go. Oh, I forgot to turn it on first. So give me a second because I forgot to do that. And so let me unhide it so you can actually see it now, but you won't know what, um, the passcode is, I cannot remember either. So even I have to go in to find out what um, passcode I chose to use today. I think it's one of the instructions I'm explaining, but I cannot remember which one. So show access code, CPR it is. All lowercase CPR, which stands for copy register. Teaching is actually exothermic. You know, it actually gets a little warm. Yeah, I'm saying that it's very good for me. Yeah, no, it's saying like no pretty good for me. So when you click on it from the um, from the to do list, it takes you to the results page for the grade. So if you go into the end of the link and you remove the submission slash whatever number, it'll take you to the actual thing. Um, and then you'll be able to, uh, I have no idea what's going on. Right. 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 I just, you just remove the last yeah. two slashes for this information. And then you can access it. Uh, you mean like you can just, oh, you're uh, right. thank you. Evan, the great team. That also is a really easy way to get from your grades page into any actual assignment rather than just looking at the submission page. I use all the time. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. I suppose I should have tested it first. So are we all good in terms of uh, making sure that I know you're here? Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, so now we resume our originally scheduled program and we have looked at the LDI instruction. All right, so the first thing is to assemble the opcode. So that means we have to go to the opcode table and well, actually before that, we have to choose a specific instruction. So we're gonna go here and go, hmm, what should we do? Well, let's pick a register that we haven't messed around with before. Let's pick register B. And we are going to load a constant into register B. Um, the assembler can only do with base 10 numbers right now. So you can only specify a base 10 integer between zero and 255 because it has to be containable within a byte. So you guys can tell me what number you want to use. 255, 255? that's too easy. Oh. <laughs> zero. zero, that's too easy. 13. 13? Okay, we'll use 13, sure. 
But this time, but okay, 13 sounds easy to you, but I'm gonna make it harder by myself, okay? If there's a harder way to do something, I'll find it, right? And I'll do it that way. So we'll look at 13 as one times 10 plus three. So we'll type in the expression to do it, okay? So we'll say it is 10 one times three plus. This is called postfix notation. You enter the values that you'll be working on first, then you specify what you do with the values. So the postfix notation is used by the assembler um, because it is a very easy parser to write. Yes, it is because of my own laziness that you guys have to learn how to do with postfix notation. But postfix notation actually has applications beyond this class. Um, what is PDF? I know I'm talking about something that does not seem to have any connection, but tell me what is PDF? It's a extension, but what is the full name of PDF? That is correct, portable document format. And who invented this particular format? It's a company that starts with an A, it's, uh, it has five letters long. Adobe, very good, okay. So PDF, most people look at PDF as, oh, it's just a way to encode you know, what to show on the screen or what to send to the printer and so on and so forth. That it is, but it's beyond that. PDF is actually a programming language. In other words, you can write your own code to specify what you want to draw on a piece of paper or on the screen. You can make loops, you can call subroutines, you can define your own subroutines, you can draw a spiral, blah, 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 and so on and so forth, okay? So PDF turns out to be evolved or it is um, a revision based on PS or you know, abbreviated as PS, which is PostScript, okay? How many people know what is PostScript? Yeah, this is the wrong generation to ask that question because in my generation, every single printer is PostScript compliant, okay? In other words, PostScript is a language that you communicate with the printer with so that you can tell the printer what to draw on the piece of paper. You're not sending out the pixels. You're not sending, oh, okay, this is the row of pixels. You know, we need a dark pixel here, white pixel, white pixel, dark pixel, dark pixel, and so on. Instead, you say, um, I want to draw a circle, this is where the center is, and I want the radius to be like this, and the thickness of the circle needs to be this much, this wide, and so on and so forth. Okay, and once again, it is a programming language. Okay, okay, so getting back to where you make the connection to what you see here, what do you think is the reason why PostScript is called PostScript? P O S T S C R I P T. Because of that, it after the numbers. Yep. Yep. It uses postfix notation in order to specify operations. So you can indeed write programs using the postfix notation. And if you have a parent about my age or maybe slightly older, they will be familiar with HP calculators. I mean, in your generation, TI is king. Okay. But in my generation, HP was king. I mean, most of you probably did not even know that HP made calculators. Well, they did not just made calculators, they owned the calculator market back in those days. But back in those days, we don't have, we cannot fit enough transistors into a tiny little handheld device. So the use of infix and the use of parentheses is too difficult. And what do they do? They use Postfix notation because it's a whole lot easier to parse and it gets the job done in. So postfix notation is not um, something that Tack invented and used in his own class. It has existed, existed for a long time. It's just that in your generation, most of you did not have any exposure to postfix notation. All right, so that's how we specify 13. Okay, you look at this and go like, I don't think so, Tech. You know, I think this is going to give me a syntax error. So we'll go to the assembler. Okay, so let me go find the assembler. It is not on this tab. Let me go find it. <clears throat> yeah, 
You have no idea how many tabs I have opened. And this is a really great tool to search for a tab. Yes. If you want to directly enter into the RAM, you have to, um, then you have to do the calculation yourself and then enter it in hexadecimal. But we do have the assembler. So we're gonna use the assembler to deal with that. So we have LDI, which register B, and let me change the, uh, okay, I'm gonna press enter here. The assembler is gonna complain, but that's okay. All right, so it, it, it complained because I did not specify which uh, register X expected and recognize something in RPN. So RPN, by the way, is reverse Polish notation, which is another name of postfix expression. I do not know why it's Polish, but that's what the name is, okay? RPN is reversed Polish notation. Hmm? Oh, okay. All right, so we specify that with uh, RPN expression, press the enter key and the error message should go away, but there's no telling what value it actually assembles into, right? So we go to the assemble tab, and then we can find out. So the, in the assemble tab on row one, we can see what the instruction is. On column W, it specifies the location of the first byte of the row, which is the 6D. That is our opcode, okay? We can verify the opcode later on. But column Y on row one is the 0D, which is the 13th, okay? Mr. B, Occupy its own byte location in RAM. Is that okay? Because I do want to make sure that everybody understands how the instruction is specified in RAM. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So why do we get the opcode of 60? That's the next question. So we go back to the opcode table and then we go back to LDI. And then the opcode is 010, which is where the six is coming from, 11XX. In other words, the 11 is constant. The XX specifies the register that we want to initialize. In this case, we want register B, which has a bit pattern of 01. So that's why the least significant um, hexadecimal is representing 1101, which is B, which is also 13. That is coincidental. <laughs> Are we doing okay so far? So the entire instruction is represented by two bytes. 60 is the actual opcode, but then the next 0D is representing the constant that we want to initialize register B with. So there we go. So now we switch to this thing here. And then we reset, control R, reset the entire thing. So is that the reset button that you were talking about, um, Jaron, Jaron? Um, hmm? I was talking about a reset button at the top. At the top. Oh, that's the global reset. Yeah. You mean this thing here? Yeah, it's a global reset. So it connects to every single thing that connects to the reset tunnel. So were you, when you were talking about it before, were you only talking about that other reset button? No, um, I'm not even sure what the reset, how the reset is gonna help in this case, because when you press the reset button, it should reset every single register to, to zero. So anyway, let's focus on this one and I'll go back and take a look at that one. So we have 6D, 0D, and then the whole instruction is a zero one. There we go. So we just hard coded the program into RAM. In other words, I did not even go through the download and then you know, load content into RAM and stuff like that. I just hard coded the whole thing. Three bytes, it's not a problem, okay? And this time I'm not gonna go through you know, the, the fetch and the decode. I'm gonna focus on the execute cycle. But there's one thing that is important is you know, in that process, the program counter auto increments to zero one. Okay, that part is important. So we have control T, this is fetch. 
uh, auto increment of the micro code pointer, which we cannot see, and then program counter auto increments. Now, this is important because otherwise, how do we know where to find that zero D byte? This is how we find it, okay? And then control T again, which is a decode. And this is where we pause, okay? Because this is where we look at the connectivity between the components so that we can understand exactly how the instruction of the works, okay? Exactly what kind of pathways do we establish between what components and so on and so forth. The lab does require you to do the same thing to an instruction that we are not covering in the lecture. I mean, what is the fun of replicating something that I talk about in class? I mean, there's no fun in it. So we got to do something that's a little bit different, but it's the same approach, okay? So the way we analyze the circuitry, the way we analyze you know, how things are being connected is what you need to do in the lab. But it's a different instruction. Things are a little bit different, but very similar nonetheless, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look. So we take a look at the, the few components that can potentially update. So we look at this thing here and ask, okay, what is gonna be updated? So remember, there are only three or four things that you can start with, even though this whole thing looks really busy. There's RAM, okay? So we know RAM is being used, okay? That's good. Because if you know the RAM is being used, the next question is, are we reading or writing? What do you think? Can someone tell me, are we reading from RAM or are we going to overwrite content in RAM? Reading. We are reading because load is a one. Okay, so RAM load is a one, which means we are reading from RAM. Okay, so we have now two additional questions. One is, who is telling me where I'm reading? And then the second question is, uh, okay, now that we are reading this location, the content in this location, who cares, right? You know, who's updating because of this? So that prompts two additional questions. We'll answer the first question first. Who is controlling or who is specifying the A port of RAM, which basically specifies the address that we are reading from? So the way I'm gonna do it is really step-by-step, step, okay? You know, doing this in Logisim is better than doing it on a, paper, on a piece of paper because when you click on a wire using the coding tool, it highlights the entire node. If that node you know, is broken up because of using the use of tunnels, it will still up, you know, it will still highlight the entire node, which makes it very easy to track down how things are connected. So it ends up as the output of a multiplexer, but we know how to do this, right? Your multiplexer is nothing more than a switch. So we just have to understand how the switch is connecting. It's connecting input one to the output. So we now track down input one and input one goes straight to the output of the program counter. So the program counter specifies where I'm reading in red, okay? Because location zero one is exactly where the byte zero D is located and the zero D is representing the 13 that we are trying to load into register B. So that answers the first question. Second question is, um, why, who, who cares about the data port of RAM? So that question can be answered in a very similar way. We click on this wire and we look at everything that is highlighted. And it, there's a lot of stuff, right? This connection here is irrelevant because the instruction register is not enabled. In other words, yeah, the data is presented to the instruction register, but because the enable is off, that means, you know, on the rising edge, the instruction register is not going to do a single thing. Okay. All right. So where else are we going to? Um, it also connects to this demultiplexer, the output of this demultiplexer. But it's okay because the demultiplexer has an enable of zero, which means this demultiplexer is not even enabled. Okay. So that's not going to answer the question that we have. And then we have two additional connections. One is here and one is here. This connection does not matter because this multiplexer has, an, has a select of zero and this is input one. So that means it's a dead end on this side as well. So the only thing that potentially may be doing something useful would be this connection here. 
So this is the input zero of this multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of zero, which means we are, and it's also enabled by the way. So that means the output of the D port of RAM is indeed connected to the in of the register band. Okay, so we know that much. We also know RIEN, which is register input enable is also a one. So now it is time to go inside the register bank and find out what is gonna get updated. So according to this register input select is a zero one. And that zero one is used to route the decoder. So remember what a decoder is? Can someone explain to me what is a decoder? If the multiplexer is a demultiplexer with a single bit input of one as a constant. Yes, so that is correct. So, okay. So where are we routing that constant of one? That becomes the next question, right? That's the only thing we need to ask. Well, the select is zero one. So that means output zero one is getting that one. You know, the implicit input of one. So that means we are routing that one to register B. Register B ends up having the enable being a one and the input uh, port D connects to register input or just in of the register bank, which is zero D and that is coming from the D port of RAM. And that's why on the next rising edge, B register B updates to zero D. Are we doing okay so far with this explanation? All right. So we'll go ahead and do a control D, control T to update, right? So we know the clock is low at this point. So a control T will update it to a one, which means we have a rising edge right there. And now we can see how register B just updated to zero D. You know, I forgot to update to show you one thing, but that's kind of important, but I forgot to show you. Look at the program counter. The program counter was zero one. It is now zero two. How did it get to zero two? Well, the connections are still correct. Okay, it's just that we are now post rising edge. I kind of wanted to show you before the rising edge, but it's okay. PCEN is a one, which means we specified that the program counter was to be updated. Okay, are we good so far? So now we have to ask the next natural question. What question is that? We now know that the program counter is getting updated. What is the next question? How is it up? How was it updated? Okay. If something is updated, you ask, how is it updated? Who is supplying the data to update this thing that I know is being updated? Okay. So that, once again, okay, I want to go back to, um, you know, the way I think. This is what I would call dependency kind of thinking, because, you know, when something is updated, um, it, you depend on who is supplying the data, right? You know, because you want to know how it is updated. So it is the dependency thing that it's causing me to ask, uh, who's connected to the D port when we had a rising edge? Well, it's coming out of the multiplexer. If it's a multiplexer, we have to look at the select to find out how you know, how the switch was compared earlier. And it is selecting input zero. So input zero is coming out of the auto increment vector. So that explains why the program counter was updated to zero two. At the same time, the register B updated to zero D. Those two updates occurred at exactly the same time. So we would not have been able to observe both at the same time because one is inside the register band and the other one is outside of the register band. Are we doing okay so far? Why do we update the program counter? Why do we have to update it to zero two? Why don't we just leave it as zero one? Say again? That is, I'm going to interpret that as if we did not, 
then the next batch cycle will be trying to look at the zero V as an output, which it was not intended as such. Is that kind of what you meant? Okay. Yep, that is correct. Because we have to skip over that zero D byte because the only purpose of that byte is to specify, okay, 13 is the value that we want to use to update register B. That was the, the entire intention of that one byte. It was not an opcode. So that's why once it is used to update register B, we want to skip that byte. The program counter needs to move on to the next available location, which is zero two, which is where we have the halt instruction. Is that okay? Yep, go ahead. Is it ever, so, so we have an opcode and we have an extra byte that's storing our value. Yes. Is it ever possible to have more than one? You can certainly design microcode because each instruction or each um, each opcode has up to 15 slices of microcode to do its work. So yes, you can certainly you know write the microcode in a way that each step would auto increment the program counter and then do something with the next byte and then increment the program counter, do then something with the next byte and so on. So yes, you, in fact. <clears throat> I will I will challenge some of you to invent a new opcode to initialize all registers with four consecutive bytes after an opcode. So do not use one of the opcodes that's currently in use. So pick something else, okay? But the ROM can be modified. You can basically say, you know, I want to invent this new opcode where I can specify four additional bytes after the opcode. The first one goes to register A, the second one goes to register B, the third one goes to register C, and the last one goes to register D. I want to initialize all four registers at the same time with one single opcode. You can do that. Now, the assembler cannot handle it because the assembler is designed kind of hard coded to only have two operands, but if you want to, you know, play with it and just by you know poking or initializing the content in red, you can certainly do that. Okay, so does that answer your question? Or your, your yeah. question? Okay. All righty. Well, we I have never shown you how the halt instruction operates. So this is the first time we will see you know, the halt instruction in action. So now the focus is back to the controller of the processor. In other words, we are now going to have a falling edge, right? Because you know, the clock is currently high, so control B is, is, is going to be a falling edge. The bifocal point is going to update, and the multiplexer is pointing to input one, which is connected to the auto increment mechanism. Location 6D1 has two followed by six zeros, which means you know, it is going to reset the microcode pointer. So nothing too exciting is gonna happen. We are simply going back to the fetch cycle. So here's control T, all right. So this time, where are we fetching from? We're fetching from location zero two, which is where the halt instruction is located. So this is the halt instruction, which has an opcode of zero one. So let's switch to the description of the halt instruction and see how it is described. So this way we kind of get an idea of what it is supposed to do. This is the halt instruction. And in terms of the English description, it says halt forever. It's in, in terms of the uh, RTL or the C notation, it is a forever loop that does absolutely nothing. Okay, in other words, once we get to the halt instruction, there's no way to move forward any further. Is that okay? So the question is, how do we do this? How do we make sure that we do not move forward after this point? So we go back to the processor and then we'll complete the fetch and the decode without further explanation because I explained it twice already, once today and once on last Thursday. So control T, this is the fetch. This is incrementing the micro code pointer. Uh, this is incrementing the program counter and this is decode, okay? So now we have location 010 in the ROM and interestingly, it has all zeros 
for that particular location. We have 26 zeros coming out of the D port of ROM. So why would these you know, end up doing absolutely nothing? Well, one thing is we know none of the registers is going to be enabled. Because in this processor, enable means a one, so nothing is enabled. Uh, we know RAND cannot be selected because you know, one means selected and zero means not selected. So that means nothing is happening. But TAC, there's one register that, if that has been enabled, you know, co uh, connected to a constant. If it's constant of one, it is connected to the enable of the micro component. So the micro component will keep changing changing in quotes. So what's going to happen here? Well, we'll figure it out, okay? In other words, uh, when we have a rising edge, we know nothing is going to happen because none of the components that is sensitive to a rising edge is going to do anything because they all have the enable, they all have the enable being a zero. So we know the, uh, the register bank is not going to do anything, the ALU is not going to do anything, RAM is not going to do anything. The instruction register is not going to do anything. Okay, simply because the enable will be all zeros for those components. So control T. Okay, so nothing happens. So now we have a falling edge, right? So the falling edge is okay. Pat, are you doing something tricky again with location zero one one? Maybe it's because of that. Okay, so we'll go take a look at that location first. To find out you know, what kind of trick I am doing in this case. So we need to go to location 010. And the next location is just all zeros too. We go like, well, but at some point we're going to run out of zeros, right? Because if the theory is we just keep moving on with these zeros, then eventually we'll hit something that is a non zero down here. And then the processor will do something that, is, that we did not intend. Okay, so that does not explain why the whole construction is halting. So the only other explanation is, well, let's just try to follow the connections, the multiplexers, and find out on the falling edge, because the clock is high right now, so the next control T is gonna be a falling edge. So let's find out how the micro pointer is gonna update on this falling edge, okay? Because you know, that's the best way to figure out what's gonna happen. So the input, of the micro code pointer comes from the multiplexer. The multiplexer has to select of zero because everything coming out of ROM are zeros, right? So that means input zero to the, from the, of the multiplexer connects to the output. And where is it connected to? It's connected to the instruction register, right? And the four bits that are zeros. So can someone tell me how the micro code pointer is going to be updated it's going to update quote unquote to zero one zero again and then you guys go like but the micro code pointer is already zero one zero you are correct and that's how we get stuck in a new loop that we cannot get out because basically it is decoding again but it keeps decoding the same opcode here because you know that opcode is not going to change any further. We do not get to the fetch anymore. So without going to fetch, the instruction register stays exactly the same. So you can keep decoding that thing and it's going to land you exactly at the same spot in terms of the micro pointer. We are basically stuck at location 010 in the ROM from here on. Is that okay? So that explains why the halt instruction is capable of doing what the halt instruction is supposed to do. Now the halt instruction sounds really stupid, right? Why would you want to put an infinite loop at the end of, a, of main in the C program? The answer is no, we do not want to do that because when the program is done, it's supposed to terminate and go back to the operating system so that the operating system can do something else. But in the case of this processor, there's nothing to go back to. When your program is done on this processor, there's nothing else you want it to do. You do not want it to cycle through all the locations in RAM, go back to the beginning and do something because that is not what you probably want the program to do. So that's why the halt instruction is actually useful in this case. 
Do we have any questions? Because we have just gone through the execution of the CPR instruction, the LDI instruction, and now we have the halt instruction. Yes? Why do we don't say halt? Hmm? Why do we don't say halt? If you do not specify halt, then it will simply move on to the next location because the it will fetch the next location. And the next location, so in other words, if this was not a zero one, it would have been usually zero zero, right? So the question is, is zero zero a valid opcode? That's the first question. And the second question is, if it is a, a valid opcode, what does it do? All right, so to answer that particular question, there are two ways to answer that question. One way to answer the question is without even referring to the opcode table. In other words, we look at the opcode of zero, zero, and then we ask, when we decode the opcode of zero, zero, what do you think the microcode pointer becomes? Let me ask that question again. The opcode is zero, zero. It is stored in the instruction register. So when we decode zero, zero, what do you think the microcode pointer becomes? Zero, zero, zero. Hmm. I vaguely remember that when the microcode pointer is at zero, 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 and we have a rising X, we have a specific name for that transition. What is it? Fetch. It's fetch. In other words, the uh, opcode of zero, zero is just saying fetch. What is it fetching? Whatever the program counter is, is pointing to. So, I can show you, okay, an animation of what a program would do when it is all opcodes of zero, zero. Some of you have seen this already by mistake, but we are going to go through this. But in order to see it, it's probably best to not to use the highest tick frequency. I would pick 32 and then to a control K to auto click. This is what it does. It just runs through all the code of zero, zero because the moment it moves on to the next location, it says fetch. And it moves on to the next location, it says fetch, fetch, fetch. So in other words, it is basically stuck just fetching the next opcode. And because the entire program are just saying fetch the next opcode, it doesn't do a single thing useful. Does that, does that explain you know, the opcode of zero, zero? Okay. So I'm gonna stop you know, this nonsense here, okay? Control K to stop this. And then when we go back to the opcode table, you will see that there's actually one row corresponding to the opcode of 000. zero, zero. zero, zero. It's called no op. NOP stands for no operation. I think that's aptly named because it really does not do a single thing, but there's a difference between halt and no op because the C notation of no op is open close phrase, which is a block statement in C++ that doesn't do a single thing. But does it move on to the next available statement? Yes, it does, right? But when you look at the explanation of halt, it is a forever loop. It, does, it cannot move on from that point any further. So no op is basically just taking additional memory locations, but not doing anything. Halt on the other side, on the other hand, is basically saying, we are stopping here, okay? We are not gonna move on from here forever. So there's a difference between those two instructions, even though they seem to be related, they're not. And the halt is, I mean, the halt instruction is intentional. We really need to have one opcode to specify, let's stop here. The no op is not even an intended instruction. It just turns out that location zero, zero, zero in ROM is the fetch cycle. So it's not even intended as an opcode. Now, in reality, no op is actually quite useful in certain situations for hackers. So if you, how many have you, how, how many people have heard of, um, Stack Overflow exploits. Okay, a few. Okay, so a Stack Overflow exploit basically relies on the program being able to inject certain content on the stack, and then later on be able to transfer control. In other words, 
um, through magical means, you change the program counter to somewhere on the stack, the same location that you have just corrupted. Okay, but we cannot exactly control which part of the stack. Corrupt. So what we need is a slide. Okay, so what we need is a no op slide. You basically end up with hundreds of no op instructions. So this way, if you if the program counter lands on any one of those no op instructions, it lands on the slide, and the slide eventually will end up at the payload of the malicious code. Then your program, you know, the program will then execute the malicious code and do bad things. So no op is actually quote unquote useful from the perspective of hackers. Unfortunately for the hackers. It is typically not used if the opcode of zero zero cannot be used because the most common stack overflow method is to is to exploit people using string copy S T R C P Y. How many people know what I'm talking about? String copy S T R C P Y as a C function. Only a few people. You mean the rest of you did not learn anything about strings? Or you only use the C string library, the Wimpy way. <laughs> okay. So anyway, string copy is very easy. The concept is simple. It's basically saying, give me the starting point of where to copy from. Give me the starting point of the destination, and I'll keep copying until I see a no terminate. That's what it does. Okay. So the exploit typically would make use of it would try to exploit a, a, a standard where there's actually a maximum number of characters in terms of the specification and then the hacker will intentionally make a string longer than what it really should be so a careless programmer assuming everything is going to play by the rules is going to say i'm just a new string copy because everybody plays by the rule my my buffer has enough room to store you know, whatever is coming from the packet, from the buffer, from the CD-ROM or whatever, okay? But since the actual string is longer, it's going to overwrite, it's going to overflow the buffer, which is a local variable which, is lives, which lives on the stack. You don't know that yet, but we will later in the semester. But that is how people can inject content onto the stack intentionally. By overwriting things, you know, with certain you know, type of content. So the question is, what are we going to use to overwrite that content of, of, of the stack? So that typically would be the payload of malicious software, uh, like opening a connection to the outside world, uh, contacting mothership, ask for further instructions, that sort of stuff, right? So that's what stack of stack overflow is about. Um, in fact, you know, maybe later in this semester, I can demonstrate you know, how to hack a program by you know, observing what is on the stack and uh, doing some disassembly and stuff like that. Maybe. It depends on whether we have time to do it or not. But before we go, I need to show you the access code of today's lab. <clears throat> so give me a second here for to show you that. Okay, I'm gonna unhide the lab first. And then go to this lab here. The access code of the lab is LDI in all lowercase. So LDI is the instruction that I talked about today. Lowercase, that's the access code. Oh, wait. Thank you. 